So again, originally we had this scheduled for uh, the end of February. We're so thankful that you all are able to join us today. Um, I know that we uh, we're really looking forward to getting this content to you all. Um, can't say enough good things about Jed and his work. Um, I'll let him tell a little bit more of his personal story as well as his connection to um, the disability community as an employer. Um, but really just wanted to go ahead and kick it off um, to say thank you all so much for joining the National Down Syndrome Society's webinar uh, on disability inclusion in the workforce with Jed Seifert. Uh, we're thrilled to have you joining us today to discuss employment um, as well as uh, really looking at the inclusion um, potential for companies um, so some of you may be representing uh, the, the disability community from a, a caregiver lens. Some of you may be representing from an employer standpoint or maybe a Down syndrome affiliate group uh, or some other advocacy organization. So we welcome you all to take notes, tune in. Um, we'll have a time for question and answers at the end, uh, but really looking forward to, to having an engaging uh, conversation and, and presentation uh, here today. So before we dive in, there's just a couple of important housekeeping items that I want to cover. Um, to ensure that everyone has an enjoyable experience. First, we encourage you to submit your questions using the Q&A feature located at the bottom of the screen. We will do our best to answer as many questions as possible at the end of the presentation, uh, but we also kindly ask if you do not include anyone's personal uh, employment experience to ensure that we're being respectful of everyone's privacy. Um, so we'll just save some of those more personal questions, maybe for a follow-up email. Happy to entertain those uh, and answer those if, if that's how you would um, choose to connect. Um, if we're not able to answer your questions during the webinar today, we would encourage you to reach out specifically to the email info at ndss.org, um, and we can help get you to the right part of our organization, um, perhaps directly to our employment team to be able to answer some more questions. Um, that email address will be shared in the chat box here throughout the webinar. Lastly, we want to remind you that this webinar is being recorded and that you will receive a copy of the recording in your email within a week. Uh, along with a list of links and resources mentioned during the presentation. So thank you so much for your attention and uh, let's get started. Today we're incredibly lucky to be joined by Mr. Jed Seifert. Jed is the co-founder of Stakes Manufacturing, a print-on-demand apparel company out of Cleveland, Ohio, where they are passionate about inclusion and currently employing a number of individuals with um, different abilities. I will also brag uh, just a little bit on Jed. Um, they earned an, an incredible award from the Association of People Supporting Employment First, which is a, a national uh, network of uh, organizations. Uh, they have a parent organization uh, and also state chapters, but really focused on um, inclusive employment and really eliminate, eliminating um, sub-minimum wage practices uh, in, in different states across the country. So uh, Stakes Manufacturing won the Employer of the Year Award in 2022. Uh, quite an achievement and uh, something that I'm, I'm proud to share on behalf of my friend Jed. Um, before we have Jed jump in, I just want to share a bit about uh, what we do here at NDSS. So we were founded in 1979, uh, and the National Down Syndrome Society's mission is to empower individuals with Down syndrome and their families by driving policy change, providing resources, engaging with local communities, and shifting public perceptions. And as I mentioned, we've been doing this since 1979, so I hope you'll join us in celebrating our 45th uh, anniversary throughout this year. And please stay tuned as we will share more information and um, have some updates uh, about how we're gonna be celebrating throughout this year. So um, another thing that is important to note is just within our core programs, the National Down Syndrome Society supports and advocates for the Down Syndrome community by focusing on three key areas of programming. Uh, those include resources and support, advocacy and policy, and community engagement. Um, some of you may know, and we'll share a little bit more detail about this in later slides, that uh, on the advocacy and policy side of things, we will be hosting our Down Syndrome Advocacy Conference in Washington, D.C. next week. We will be standing at the capital of, uh, excuse me, at the steps of our nation's capital um, to promote positive policy for the Down Syndrome community on World Down Syndrome Day, uh, which is March 21st. So excited about that opportunity. Within our core programs, um, we offer a 1-800 helpline, an info box email um, that's set up to really take in inquiries from the community. So anyone that wants to reach out uh, at any time to ask questions uh, about really any topic having to do with Down syndrome, whether it's, again, you know, kind of the nature of this webinar around employment uh, resources or connections to employers or supports um, within the community or even questions about you know, diagnosis, um, prenatal diagnosis or birth diagnosis, or even just looking at 
what types of research um, and medical supports are available for the Down syndrome community, really covering a range of topics um, from employment, education, health, wellness, aging, and caregiving um, to be accessed for free um, on our website, um, also through some of our guidebooks and resource development. So um, we'll share a few links, like I said earlier, uh, specific to the employment topic, um, but have a ton of other topics that are covered within our uh, resource space. We'll be happy to share those with you all as well. The National Down Syndrome Society also advocates for state and uh, local level um, legislation. We develop and approve laws and positively impact people with Down syndrome across the country and affirm their human rights. Our legislative agenda includes bills and priorities that span the entire lifespan experience um, of individuals with Down syndrome. And as I mentioned before, we'll be heading to the Capitol uh, on March 21st for World Down Syndrome Day and our Down Syndrome Advocacy Conference. We hope to see you along with um, another, say, 350 or 400 individuals and family members uh, of those with Down syndrome. And we'll drop a, a link to the registration in the chat for that as well, for those of you who are interested. Uh, a couple other key pieces under community engagement. Uh, we have resources and supports and advocacy and policy work that really uh, drive it home, you know, some of the key tenets of NDSS's work. We really like to do this through a number of avenues. So one of the things we offer is scholarships and grants. Um, sometimes these are specific to entrepreneurs of, um, you know, or entrepreneurs with Down syndrome, individuals that um, own or operate their own business. We also uh, engage in the community through our National Buddy Walk program and Times Square video presentation, which will be happening in September of this year. Uh, and also we do a number of charity races and runs um, from uh, and and also coordinate through our uh, Down Syndrome Ambassador Program to build awareness um, and fundraising throughout the year. In addition, we have um, our Down Syndrome, excuse me, in addition to our Down Syndrome Advocacy event on March 21st, we have a ton of other upcoming events. I mentioned charity racing runs that are taking place throughout the month of March. And then of course our New York City Buddy Walk, which will be taking place later in September. And then um, soon to be announced publicly, we will have our uh, adult summit, which is taking place in November and uh, look for that to pop up on the West coast of the United States. We'll have again, more details coming up in the next couple of days and weeks uh, as to how folks can get registered for that event um, and even opportunities for speaking and presenting. All right, so now um, after uh, all of the anticipation, I am now honored to introduce you formally to our, ho our friend, uh, Jed Seifert. As I mentioned before, Jed is the co-founder of Stakes Manufacturing, a print-on-demand apparel company out of Cleveland, uh, where they're incredibly passionate about um, inclusion and really making sure that uh, individuals with disabilities are, um, you know, finding their place in employment. Uh, so as I mentioned before, Stakes was awarded the APSI 2022 National Employer of the Year, recognizing their hard work building an inclusive workforce and employing people with disabilities. Jed is the proud younger brother of Darren, who has Fragile X, and has always been Jed's inspiration. Jed has been working with the disability community since he started coaching Special Olympics as a young teenager. Uh, Jed has also served as a board member for the National Fragile X Foundation and a partner to the CEO Commission for Disability Employment, uh, founded by Voya Financial, the Society for Human Resource Management, SHRM, and the National Down Syndrome Society. He has also served on the board of directors and, and business advisory council for a group called SEEK, an organization dedicated to helping individuals with Down syndrome, excuse me, with disabilities attain meaningful employment opportunities uh, and he supports his brother. So now, with all this information, I'd like to welcome Jed. Jed? How are you guys doing? Thanks for having me. So, uh, excited to talk to you guys today and kind of tell you a little bit about uh, my story and, um, you know, about my brother and my business and sort of the impact that it's made uh, both on my family's life uh, as well as my business. Uh, I think that um, it's very few things more important than employment and disabled community because uh, financial independence is something that is, you know, can really change lives. Uh, so my brother is Fragile X. Growing up, my brother, you know, started off in a school just with folks with disabilities and got into a mainstreaming program in high school um, and then he started doing some vocational training through his high school. And, uh, you know, anybody who's a, a parent or a sibling of somebody with disabilities, 
typically you spend most of your life, you know, worrying about what's going to happen after you're gone, how are they going to be supported? Um, and I think that, you know, two most challenging times are, you know, one, when you first find out that your, you know, your child or, or brother has disabilities or sibling. Uh, and the next one is really that transition outside of high school, um, because, you know, the structure of school, the friends, um, the education and all of that kind of disappears and, and you enter this sort of black hole. And uh, we had, uh, you know, a lot of challenges to, you know, going through that while my brother got into these vocational, pro was in these vocational programs, a lot of the jobs weren't a good fit. Uh, some of the managers um, weren't really um, set up to, you know, help them be successful. Um, my brother had one of the sort of internships that he ended up really liking was um, sorting mail. Um, and that was sort of the best experience that he had in, in high school. And then when we got out of high school and, you know, my brother's in his 40s, so you know, services were a lot more limited back then and have really come a long way since then. Uh, when my brother transitioned out of uh, high school, he started working uh, with some of these disability employment service providers where, and trying to find a job, a paying job. And it was a big challenge. There weren't as many employers out there that were willing to hire people with disabilities. Uh, there's a lot of preconceived notions and stigmas around hiring people with disabilities. And we went through a difficult time as a family. Uh, and he hopped from free job to free job, you know, janitorial, washing dishes, and just couldn't find him anything. And finally, my parents kind of got fed up and took it upon themselves to uh, create the job search themselves beyond sort of the service providers that they were using at the time and reached out to their entire network of friends, family, colleagues to figure out where they could find my brother position. And luckily, uh, they stumbled upon the Securities and Exchange Commission working for the federal government. Uh, there was a mailroom job that had just opened up and serendipitously that mailroom had had an individual with disabilities in it before. And my brother got a job there working for the federal government in the mailroom and it changed his life. He's now been a federal employee working in the mailroom there for 25 years. He uh, is a fantastic employee um, and he is constantly getting you know, awards and, you know, and, and, and people, uh, you know, he just does great work. It's not, he does great work for somebody with disabilities. He just does great work. And that changed my entire family's life, right? We went from my brother being a dependent living at my parents' house to my brother being able to financially support his own independence. He moved out of my parents' house, started paying his, all of his own bills and, you know, it gave him happiness, purpose, an independent life, everything that I think we all strive for. And it changed my family's life. And we went from not knowing what was going to happen, you know, if he was left alone, uh, you know, if my parents had passed and kind of all those pressures, to, you know, him being in a position to truly support himself. And it also changes the community, right? Uh, he went from a dependent to an independent taxpayer, started pumping money into the local economy through using public transportation, buying his own lunch during lunch breaks and all of that stuff. So it was a really impactful moment. And uh, you fast forward to 2017, uh, my brother has now been working for a couple of decades with SEEK, uh, which is an incredible organization in the D.C. metropolitan area that supports about three to 400 individuals with disabilities uh, finding meaningful employment as well as independent living. And my brother uh, got awarded the SEEK Employer of the Year. And I went to this event to see him get this award and was so proud of him. And they asked me to do an impromptu speech. And by halfway through the speech, I was crying because 
you know, this organization really had played such an incredible role in, you know, supporting my brother's employment and, you know, setting him up for success. And uh, by the end of it, you know, they, they, the, the bunch, most of the, a lot of people in the audience were crying and um, then they asked me to join their business advisory council. And that was sort of the moment that I really de became determined that, you know, I wanted to be a champion of disability inclusion in the workplace. And I wanted to make sure that not only at my companies was I giving individuals the same life-changing opportunities my brother got, but also help educate other companies. Because I think that one of the biggest challenges is that people, again, have these preconceived notions and stigmas about hiring folks with disabilities. And they also don't understand the services that are available, right? Uh, disability employment service providers will help companies find, screen, interview, onboard, train employees, as well as train their managers on how to work with them at no cost to the employer. You know, most of them are federally funded or grant funded, some are private, and there's these service providers all over the country. And I think that part of what I have been champion and doing kind of speaking engagements uh, across the country is helping educate people on this model, right? And um, also educating people on the success that hiring people uh, with disabilities will bring to your company. And let me be clear, we're not talking about charity. Uh, we're talking about mutually beneficial employment. If you're hiring folks with disabilities just for the warm and fuzzies, uh, it's going to be short-lived. It's, you know, uh, things get tight. That's going to be the first program that gets cut. Um, you're, if you're, you know, I run a for-profit business. So at all times, you know, we need to make sure that we're hitting our numbers and our employees are hitting our numbers, right? So uh, I think that many companies don't hire folks with disabilities because they're worried that they don't know how to manage folks with disabilities. They're worried that uh, their performance is going to decline uh, because of it. Uh, there's costs associated with it. But the reality is it's quite the opposite. It's, it is, uh, you know, my business, my, my business, I uh, started it with uh, my best friend, uh, Vince Bartosi, uh, who we've been friends since we were five. So he's been like a brother to my brother. And, you know, when we started our business a, a couple of years later, uh, Stakes Manufacturing, our first initiative was that we were going to be an inclusive business. Because oftentimes when you talk about inclusivity, it's, you know, race, religion, sexual orientation, age, but disabilities gets left out in the dark. You know, the, the unemployment rates for folks with disabilities is absolutely staggering. Um, there's different stats out there, but I think for developmental disabilities, it's upwards of 80% unemployment rate. And um, so we started the program at, at our business because while I wanted to champion disability inclusion, it was important that I first walked the walk uh, and created the own my own case study to showcase. And it, it's been an incredible journey, right? Uh, we have about 200 employees. We print uh, T-shirts for everybody from sports leagues to record labels to uh, other printing companies and entertainment companies. And, and uh about 10% of our staff at this point has developmental or intellectual disabilities, ranging from Down syndrome to autism to cerebral palsy. And we work with a number of disability employment service providers in our area. We also have a school to work transition program where we, work, where we have 12 interns a semester who get on-site job mentors, with the goal of helping them become independent workers. They work two hours a day, uh, five days a week, they get high school credit. And then at the end of high school, when they're transitioning out, it's a good fit for them and a good fit for us. Uh, they get the opportunity for uh, full-time employment. And when you look at our staff, it's become 
being an inclusive business has become a part of our culture. It's uh, become a part of who we are as a business. It started off as just sort of this vision that we launched in 2019 when we um, launched this company, but it really has become the fabric of who we are. And our, it, our employees with disabilities are some of our top performing employees. Our top performing shipper out of 35 is a gentleman with autism, and that's based off of speed and accuracy. Again, no warm and fuzzy, same benchmarks as every, every other employee. Our top warehouse employee out of 40, ge another gentleman with autism, a young gentleman with autism who was actually a graduate from our school to work transition program. And he's been the number one performing warehouse employee for the last year. And, uh, and you start to look at where all of our employees with disabilities are performing. And a lot of them are, perform like I said, are some of our highest performing employees. But it's also had an incredible impact on the rest of our business. It's changed the way that we've done business, right? You know, part of hiring folks with disabilities means, you know, looking at how, how are we training, right? Some of our training materials were um, just written, you know, handbooks. Uh, so we had to do more visuals into the handbooks, as well as transition from sort of reading about the training to more so just teaching. Uh, folks with disabilities uh, learn through repetition. And that's repetition actually makes them feel at home and excel. Now, oftentimes we talk about repetition and people think it's low skilled repetition, but it's actually there's a full spectrum of folks with disabilities um, and, and a full spectrum of, of what their abilities are, right? So, you know, we look at both high-skilled repetition and low-skilled repetition. And repetition is really where folks with disabilities flourish. And, you know, while we got started, it was after all the lessons I had learned through working with SEEK, it became very apparent that I wanted to make sure that we had a disability employment service provider supporting us and our managers. And so we started building our relationships with them and continued to hire and grow through those. And what we learned through the training process was there might be some additional changes to the way that we were training. Um, it might take a little extra time for the individual to uh, get up to speed with sort of the benchmarks that they wanted, performance benchmarks we wanted them to hit. Um, but the reality was, is they were becoming our most reliable employees, both on attendance, performance, um, also just happy to come to work and grateful. And um, it, it changed our company culture almost you know, overnight. It, it taught our other employees empathy. It, it, it brought our teams together. And I'm not just saying bringing the folks without disabilities together with the folks with disabilities, I'm talking about everybody in the entire company started being more teamwork oriented and it created a greater family atmosphere. We were very transparent with our, with our company and our employees of the goal and what we were trying to do. And what we saw was not only were the disabled employees some of our best employees, but our retention rates for non-disabled employees improved because all of a sudden people who might've left us to make an extra 50 cents at the Amazon facility, you know, a few miles down the road, you know, uh, were staying with us because of the atmosphere and the culture that we have provided. And because of, you know, the fact that they felt they were making a social impact. You know, we started off in our warehouse and because our warehouse was sort of one, we felt like the manager there was sort of the best person to start with, um, but also because it just naturally was what we thought would be a great role, right? Um, the warehouse uh, is, you know, you're going around and you're picking shirts for orders and you're stickering them to go stage them to go get printed. So it's a job where you're constantly moving. Um, I think that, you know, out the gate, some of the some of our other employees had some concerns with 
whether there was going to be an issue with technology because we use finger scanners and iPads and um, but it, there was there was never a concern on our part, right? And um, and we started in the warehouse and day one, I said to the warehouse manager, I said, look, I know this is, you know, our vision as founders, uh, but we're running a for-profit business and you've got performance benchmarks you got to hit. So if at any point you're not able to hit those benchmarks or this is, you know, becoming uh, a time suck or a resource suck, uh, we need to know about it. And we spent uh, about a month past and I went back to that same manager and I said, all right, how's it going? He's going great. I was like, no, but seriously, how, how is it? Tell, tell me, what are the things that aren't going well? And the response I got was, no, Jed, you're not understanding. These are some of our best, most reliable employees already. And I went from managing people moving boxes of T-shirts around a warehouse to feeling like every day I'm coming in and I'm changing people's lives. So you've given meaning and purpose to my life. And, and I go home feeling better than I ever did before. And that was a really impactful moment. And, uh, you know, it was such a success in the warehouse. We continued to transition it into other, to transition this inclusion program into other departments. Uh, what we also noticed is that performance of our non-disabled employees improved. So overall performance of the company was improving. Uh, when you're getting your butt kicked in uh, performance KPIs by an individual with disabilities, it's a motivating factor to work that, you know, to work harder. When you're working with somebody who's grateful for their job and comes with the right attitude every day, it changes your own attitude and, and the way you look at your job. Um, so it totally changed, uh, you know, not only the culture of our business and the atmosphere in our business, uh, but our performance. As we continued to develop the programs, we started to look at what other departments and um, and also, you know, the ways that we hired is, you know, part was through these disability employment service providers, but the other way we did it was just by changing our ads to say, hey, we hire folks with um, all different abilities. And we had a number of individuals um, apply for jobs in that, that way, right? Folks that didn't necessarily need a uh, disability employment service provider to provide support and didn't need a job coach. Uh, we had hired this one individual, Rachel, who was on the first slide, who uh, she applied for a job. She had cerebral palsy in a, wear, in a wheelchair, applied for a job folding T-shirts. And uh, this was early on, and we hired her. And to be quite frank, she wasn't a great performer at folding T-shirts because of her dexterity. Uh, but we, so I sat down and talked with her. Um, just to understand who she, you know, to get to know her. This is actually week one before I even know um, how she's performing folding t-shirts. And uh, turned out that she had a degree in cybersecurity from a major university. I'm like, well, why are you here folding t-shirts? Um, so within a few weeks, we transitioned her out of this role, which she had told me she took this job simply because Nobody else would hire her. They just, you know, every time they, she'd go in for an interview, they'd see the wheelchair, that it's a little bit more difficult to understand or speak, and nobody would give her a chance for her actual abilities. And um, within a few weeks, we transitioned her out of folding T-shirts into a role working on our technology team, doing uh, warehouse audits and inventory reports and customer reports uh, for, for, for customers. And in front of her computer, where she shined and you know our role as managers and leaders and i think that this was really taught to a lot of our uh managing staff was you know our goal is to set people up for success and and cultivate their abilities and mitigate their weaknesses or, or disabilities right so you know it was about finding the right job for the right person and that doesn't matter if they have disabilities or not. Um, today, we have folks on 
almost every department in our business. We have folks that are, you know, operating half a million dollar equipment. We have folks that are operating uh, 300 plus degree heat presses. Uh, when we when we started in the department with the heat presses, we started going, all right, what are the what are the safety concerns, right? We don't want to have anybody get hurt, right? And we did an audit and we worked with our disability employment service providers to go, all right, well, what are the safety concerns? Can this be a department that we expand, expand this inclusion program into? And the reality was we didn't have to change much. There was a couple of things that we needed to do, but we should have been doing those for all employees. Um, so it improved our overall safety in the facility because we were focusing, well, how do we make sure that we're not allowing this individual with disabilities to get hurt, but it was the same steps that we should have been taking for all individuals. So it also just improved the overall safety in our business. Um, and it's been an extreme success. That's been one of the fastest uh, growing departments. So it, it's it's taught us lessons about management and about training and about safety um, and, and tailoring everything to the individual uh, that we just never would have had before. I think oftentimes companies are concerned about, uh, you know, am I going to have to make an accommodation? Is that going to cost me all this money? And the reality is this, I think the stats say that like 90 some odd percentage of accommodations don't cost, don't cost us a, a, a penny, right? Uh, it could be just maybe changing the, the training materials. And what we also learned from that is that we should be making accommodations for all of our employees. So we didn't just say, hey, what are we going to do to help this person be successful? We wanted our entire company to know that we were willing to make accommodations to make them successful. So, you know, if you're a short individual working on a piece of equipment that it gives you back problems because of your height, well, let's give you a platform to stand on. If you're a single mother that you know, has to leave an hour early to go pick up your kids from school. Let's let you come in an hour earlier so you can leave an hour earlier. Um, and what it did was create this open atmosphere where people were finally opening up on ways that we could help them be more successful, whether they had disabilities or not. And, you know, some of the you know more beautiful moments were, you know, we had so uh, a lot of the, you, you can also, your state vocational rehabilitation office will also provide services not only to the individual to find employment, but they'll also provide services to uh, the companies. So we had them come in and do some training. And part of the training was teaching folks, just exposing folks to like some of the things they should know about working with people with disabilities. Because a lot of our staff, when before working with us, didn't have a family or friend member or friend or you know exposure to it. So um one of you know some it was examples like hey if somebody's in a in a wheelchair um you know let's don't lean down when you talk to them just talk straight standing straight up or one of the ones that I learned right I think a lot of people are worried about making mistakes. Uh I didn't know that individuals uh, that were deaf didn't want to be called hearing impaired until we hired our first deaf employees. And, you know, and I think a lot of people, employers sometimes have fear of getting things wrong, but the reality is they shouldn't like just try, like we get things wrong with employees that don't have disabilities, right? It's all sort of this, 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 this learning process. And, uh, you know, when we had this training, what they also did was kind of want to broaden people's horizons to what folks with disabilities can do. Cause again, we talked about sort of low skilled repetition, high skilled repetition. And to be quite frank, I know individuals with disabilities who aren't even in jobs that are repetitive, that are sitting in C-level positions at large organizations, right? But people don't know that they are autistic or that they're dealing with other disabilities or whatever it might be. Um, so in, in one of these activities, they took all of these jobs and all of these different disabilities and said, all right, well, what's the one that what's the disability that's le least likely to do be able to do this other one, uh, to do this job? And the number one answer with the 75 people that attended was a, a blind forklift driver. 
And the gentleman from uh, the, the vocational rehabilitation office said, well, actually, let me tell you, we have a legally blind individual who only has 10% of their vision, no peripherals, uh, that we were able to get certified uh, as a forklift driver, which is not easy certification, by setting up mirrors like your rear view mirror in your car all around the forklift to give him a 360 view. And my entire company's mind was just blown. Like, oh my God. Because people put people with disabilities into boxes and it's everybody, right? We even put ourselves into boxes not knowing what we're capable of, right? And I've done it to my brother. If you told me my brother was going to be a Special Olympics downhill skier 20 years ago, I would have told you that you were crazy. Um, if you look at the picture that's currently on the slide, we started, once we kind of had proved concept with our business, we had this three-year plan of hiring folks with disabilities year one by any means necessary. Year two, um, making sure that we really fine-tuned our relationships with all of our disability employment service providers we were working with. And year three, we wanted to scream it from the mountaintop to champion change in the print industry. Because what we noticed was that, you know, while we worked with a ton of organizations that seek, that supports my brother, like um, Hilton and M Embassy Suites and uh, the National Institute of Health and CVS and, uh, you know, all these industries, the print industry, uh, which I thought was a perfect fit that I come from, we weren't supporting anybody. So we set out to change that and started doing speaking engagements across the country about how impactful this was to our business that, you know, we're in a time where businesses across every industry are struggling to hire, yet there's this entire untapped workforce that is excited and ready to go to work. And if you're not hiring folks with disabilities, you're simply not hiring the best people because you've gotten rid of the largest minority in the country. And uh, so we started doing these speaking engagements and it was incredible the feedback we got. And we started connecting, people started reaching out to me, publicly traded co companies in the industry um, down to you know small little screen print shops. How do I get how do I get involved? What do I do? Uh, and I gave them resources to just reach out to their local disability employment service providers and start programs. And programs started to pop up across the country. Now, the image that you're looking at right now on the slideshow, uh, you have C-level executives from some of the largest machine manufacturers, garment uh, machine manufacturers, machine distributors and garment manufacturers in the industry. Um, and a few of them are cutthroat competitors on any other day. Uh, but we came together to show that we were unified in our vision of a inclusive print industry um, that was inclusive of folks with disabilities. And my brother came on stage, was on stage with us. He's the one holding the microphone in the slide. And uh, you know, hundreds of people watching, tons of cameras all over the place and he crushed it. And again, if you told me 20 years ago, even two years before it, that he would be able to do that and sit still and not get anxious. And uh, I, would, I, I wouldn't have believed it. Uh, just goes to show that like, even in, you know, a, a person like myself uh, is putting you know, my brother into a box of what he's capable. But if you look at history time and time again, whatever you say is, is, is not possible, people prove is possible. And the statistics show by a landslide that it, companies with inclusive workforces perform better than companies that don't. Uh, Sherm's got a lot of data on that. Um, there's a ton of studies that have been done. And, you know, now all of a sudden, we're starting to create this industry-wide impact and we're still trying to champion how companies can learn, grow, and succeed by having individuals with disabilities and most importantly, educating them on the model, right? Because I had one of the largest clients that we have come visit our facility and say, hey, you know, we tried to hire a couple of folks with disabilities that didn't work out. Wish we could have pulled off what you did. 
And I said, well, first question is, if you tried to hire a couple women and it didn't work out, would you just not hire women anymore? Uh, and the second question was, were you using the disability employment service provider? Or were you just kind of doing it on your own? And they were doing it on their own. And, you know, the disability employment service providers bring so much value because they're the conduit between the employer, the employee, as well as the family. So, for example, my brother fell asleep two days in a row at, at his job. And that can get you fired. Well, the, his manager contacted his job coach. The job coach contacted my family, which the manager wasn't going to do. You know, and turns out my brother's medication had been changed a week prior. And that was impacting his drowsiness. So he just needed to get his medication changed again. Uh, we've had individuals that we've had, um, one of our best performing individuals, you know, during his break was turning around some of our staging signs as sort of a nervous thing. Or um, So we talked to the job coach, job coach talks to the family, you know, the manager's also talking to the employee and telling him not, not, you know, hey, you shouldn't be doing this. But the job coach support and the family support, uh, you know, the cliche, it takes a village, truly makes it impactful and, and makes these changes happen. Uh, but what, what I have also seen is not only do companies put people in a box and say what can and can't be done, uh, oftentimes it's the parents. It's the parents that are holding the individual back. They'll never live on their own. They can't hold down you know, a, a job. Uh, one of the most rewarding moments I ever had was the parents of one of our warehouse employees visited our facility, and I didn't know who they are. I bumped into him on the floor and introduced myself. And uh, they said, hey, that's my son, but that's not my son. And I was like, well, what do you mean? They're like, we've never seen him this focused. We've never seen him so on task. We've never seen him so undistracted. We never thought this was even possible. And they just started crying. And of course I started crying and their manager, his manager came over and they, he started crying. But the reality is, is that a lot of parents are holding their children back from what's possible out of fear of what could go wrong. But that's how we learn everything in our lives, whether we have disabilities or not. It's, it's, it, failure is not a failure. It's a, it's a learning experience. You know, if something goes wrong, you learn from it. Uh, maybe that job isn't a good fit. Um, same thing to employers. If an individual isn't working out, we'll talk to the job coach and the job coach will try to help them improve their performance and get them to the benchmarks they need to be. But if it's not a good fit, it's not a good fit. Maybe we try to move them to a different department or maybe we just, that individual isn't a good fit for our company and they should look for a different job that might be tailored more to, to their abilities, right? And, uh, you know, so I encourage parents as well as the companies, like make sure it's a good fit and work with them. Uh, but don't, you know, don't kind of be, you know, assume what's possible and, and, and where there's a fit. The other good thing that the disability employment service providers do is they will come to your organization and they'll look at all the, you know, job openings that you entry level job openings you have to help you assess. So you don't even need to know if, this position's right, you know, if this position's right for somebody with disabilities or not, you, they come and they do sort of the evaluation. So I introduced a screen printer and they thought that the individual they were going to hire was going to be cleaning screens because that was sort of the only job that they thought was a good fit. Well, it turns out the job opening that they currently had that was the best fit was data entry. But in their mind, they were like, well, Folks with disabilities aren't going to be detail oriented enough to do this data entry. It's taking these orders and putting it in, and we don't want to accidentally print a hundred, you know, uh, you know, a, a thousand units when it should have been a hundred units. But that was the perfect fit, right? I think everybody has their abilities, and each disability, you know, again, people have different strengths. You know, I, I you know, my son has ADHD, and I, as do I, and I say it's a superpower, right? Because it keeps you moving all the time and you know it 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 makes you think you can accomplish anything and it and it's every disability has i believe these superpowers and everybody has uh these ways that they're going to excel it's just about putting people in the right position to be successful and uh it's been an incredible journey right it's been seeing um organizations both in the print industry 
uh, start hiring inclusively, but then also working here in the DC area, you know, with folks like Fairmont Hotels coming on board to be inclusive, just because I introduced them to a disability to, to seek and they had a conversation, right? Um, and, you know, it's, it's, tr it's truly changed, you know, my life, it's changed my family's life, uh, it's changed our company's life. And I think all companies should get involved, uh, you know, and not only are the all the internal benefits I've mentioned, but you also have, you know, individuals want to do business with companies that are making a social impact, especially the ones of the younger generation, right? Um, I also encourage companies to scream from the mountaintop that they're inclusive. Sometimes there's companies that don't want to talk about it because they think that they're using it, you know, uh, CVS, for example, a wonderful organization that's extremely inclusive. I sat on this business advisory council with somebody on it and, you know, I asked her, well, why don't you put it in your marketing materials that you're inclusive? And uh, because there's a huge population that is disabled. And I use Lyft simply because they've got a program to help people with disabilities get to work instead of Uber. So I think the tides are changing. Uh, National Down Syndrome Society in partnership with the CEO Commission is helping to champion those changes to educate companies and also change, you know, archaic policies at the federal level that are impacting people's ability to work. A lot of our employees can only work part time because if they make too much money, uh, they'll lose some of their, you know, benefits, uh, which doesn't make any sense. So um, we've come a long way since my brother started this journey in trying to find his find a job and the services have become infinitely better. Um, and we're continuing to champion that mission and National Down Syndrome Society is at the forefront of that uh, with the work that they're doing with the CEO Commission. So, um, and, and at the federal level lobbying for changes. So uh, it's been wonderful. Ryan, I, I, I could keep going, but I know you probably have more specifics that you wanna ask questions from people in the audience, but, uh, I'm all ears. Jed, thank you so much. It is truly always a pleasure to get to reconnect. Um, I know we've we've called upon you um, many a times to give uh, your thoughts and experiences and insight at um, our Adult Summit Conference, at various webinars for the CEO Commission for Disability Employment, um, you know, getting to go to other conferences that I remember being you know, not too long ago in San Diego at the Society for Human Resource Management Inclusion Conference that we spoke on a panel uh, for. And so really, yeah, just a testament to all the different avenues. I think that um, that you personally, as well as Stakes Manufacturing, as well as some of the organizations that you've represented with National Fragile X and SEEK and, um, and of course, NDSS and the CEO Commission, you know, really trying to, you know, stand this this um, systems change up, right? There's There's multiple levers. I think that can all be um, kind of worked on in tandem and um, thankful to have a great audience here today because I know that they represent a very diverse stakeholder um, group. So I think that, you know, we'll hopefully have um, some some teachers, some, of course, parents, individuals, self-advocates, uh, professionals, maybe some from the workforce development side of things, uh, and even folks being able to watch this back uh, in future uh, days and, and um, future opportunities. So thank you so much for sharing, again, your insights and uh I think the the sibling. I know. I know we have that sibling tie. I think that's kind of the unique, uh, the unique tie that binds. Um, so certainly appreciate that perspective as well. So with that, uh, we are going to open it up to questions from the audience. So we do have. Uh, it looks like perhaps perhaps a, a question in the chat. It says, "How do I, as a parent, locate a disability employment service provider?" That is a great question. Um, I will just give one quick insight that there are about seventy. Four, I believe, I want to say that number's right, um, vocational rehabilitation agencies across the country. That's not a disability uh, employment service provider in the sense of what Jed is speaking of. I mean, there's several different sort of, I guess, descriptors, but um, there are vocational rehabilitation agencies um, thrown about the United States. Those organizations receive funding from the Federal Department of Education. Um, and one of the things that's kind of neat that's happened just in recent years is um, there's a, a sort of a bucket of funding um, that has that goes out to these vocational rehabilitation agencies. If not used, it gets sent back up to the federal level and those funds are then reallocated. Uh, those are kind of categorized as disability innovation funds or DIF. 
Um, about three years ago, those DIF funds were reallocated to, I believe it was 14 states. Um, for the majority of those states, it was allocated to the tune of about um, $13 million. Some states got about $9 million. I think there were maybe two states that got 8 or $9 million, but most of them got about $13, $14 million to specifically address the um, transformation uh, concept or this idea of transitioning from sheltered workshops and uh, more isolated um, employment settings to competitive integrated employment. So states got a pretty nice cash injection to be able to really focus in on initiatives um, through different, you know, different opportunities that came about, right? Each state had to come up with its own plan for spending those funds. Um, and really, you know, I think the, the goal for the Department of Education through the VR system was to see partnerships, right? Collaboration between state level, local level um, stakeholder groups um, to be able to actually roll out programs that would help transition uh, or in really the term that's used is phase out sheltered workshops. So um, it just kind of, this is all kind of an addition, um, but really looking at uh, how those um, disability employment sort of systems are um, you know, being bolstered by the federal and state level. Those DIF funds um, actually saw another round of funding the, the following year. So 2020, excuse me, 2021, I believe was the, excuse me, 2022 were the, um, the um, SWITSI dollars or the sheltered work to competitive integrated employment. So interesting acronym. The following year was pre-ETS or pre-employment transition support. So looking at how do we start to really build up the, the education system to better transition individuals or tra transition individuals um, more efficiently into competitive integrated employment opportunities or to at least teach those employment skills. Uh, and then there was even a third round of funding that came out or that I think is coming out this year. So those are some unique um, aspects to this dynamic as well. I will say too that um, there's information about the number of um, 14 C certificates. So Jed sort of talked about this uh, a little bit, but um, the, uh, the federal law that allows organizations to pay individuals with disabilities a sub minimum wage is housed within the Fair Labor Standards Act under section 14 C. Um, and so there's a certificate that organizations can acquire that actually allows them to pay that sub minimum wage or commensurate wage, wage based on an algorithm um, and, and the individual's production level. Um, so there, the number used to be close to about 1500 certificates around the country that were being utilized to, again, pay individuals with disabilities a sub minimum wage. The total number of individuals receiving a sub minimum wage under those certificates was kind of hard to calculate because of reporting. Um, but there was well over um, hundreds of thousands of individuals at one point um, in the very recent past. So within the last five years or so, that number of certificates has gone from 1,400 down to about 800 just in the last three years. So that just tells you how states are phasing out those practices and how it's actually turning into um, you know, a, a lower uptake of that um, certificate. I do wanna emphasize that um, NDSS is really looking at a way to um, in, encourage systems change. This isn't a light switch. We're not saying, hey, sheltered workshops are a thing of the past, go in, you know, turn that light switch off, close the doors, and no one's allowed to go back. We understand that families need the opportunity to um, find different structures. We understand, too, that communities need the opportunity to identify ways to teach employment skills, to be able to find meaningful day opportunities for individuals with disabilities, whether it's employment or volunteer work or other occupational um, you know, endeavors. And so really what we look at here is a phase out approach. Um, so I know that that's kind of a really big, long answer, but um, disability employment service providers are very much a part of that system. Um, but uh, Jed, I'm sure you'll have other thoughts on, you know, how people can connect based on your experience as well. Yeah, I want to just be abundantly clear that uh, we pay our individuals with uh, disabilities no different than we pay any employee. Uh, you're based, you're, you're paid, uh, you know, you're on your performance and there is no, um, you know, change. And we really do need to change that. It, 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 it's very bothersome that folks are still taking advantage of that, but it's impressive the work at, you know, kind of changing that and what's happened. So uh, I think that you mentioned that the, you know, you can simply Google your, your state and then vocational rehabilitation office. You can also Google your state and then the developmental disabilities organization, um, you can also Google your local area, so whatever your city is, and then put disability employment service providers. Um, those will oftentimes come in 
come up um, and you can find them that way. Uh, there's also uh, another organization um, called the NET, which is the uh, National Employment Team, uh, which is a division of CSAVR.org. Um, there's APSI, who's the National Trade Organization of Disability Employment Service Providers. Um, they can also uh, kind of put you in the right direction to connect you with a local provider. Um, the ARC has a number of chapters across the country, and um, some of them actually provide uh, job services, both to the individual as well as the company. Um, and then there's uh, Anchor, which is A-N-C-O-R, which is another organization. Um, we've mentioned the CEO Commission for Disabilities. Um, that's more on the business side than the individual. Um, there's other wonderful organizations like Disability Inn. Um, and then you can also go to ODEP, which is a part of the Office of Employment Policy. Um, and there is also um, OPM. So I can just put a bunch of... Uh, these links into the chat. Um, but really, I would start with your local VR office. That's, that's typically the best place to start. Um, and, you know, you can easily Google a lot of these things um, and just in, in your area to find it. And what I would say is um, make sure that uh, if you're not getting the attention or the success that you're looking for, um, don't be scared to go to someone else, right? Just like any hiring agencies, some, whether you're a business or a parent, some are more successful than others. Some are gonna be more proactive than others. So there's a whole bunch of links I just put into the, I hope that all came in. Thank um, you so much, Jed. Did that I, um, I know we're getting, oops, sorry. I, uh, I know we're getting close to time. If it doesn't, in fact, make it into the chat, Jed, we'll make sure to include it in our follow-up email to participants. Okay. Um, so no worries there. We'll make sure we get that from you. Um, and then I do want to just call out, we had some great questions. Um, Can I actually just add one last thing for that parent? Because I know we're going to run out yeah. of time. If you're not able to find your child a job through the service providers, or maybe you live in an area without some of these service providers, nobody's gonna champion your child like you are. So I encourage you to do the same things that my parents did, which is reach out to your personal networks through Facebook, through LinkedIn, your professional networks, um, and don't be afraid of your child getting a job, even if it starts you know, being for free because they're learning to work and get into routine um, and, and really leverage your network, uh, not just these services, uh, to, to, to find if you're, if you're not getting the success you, that you're looking for. Yeah. Um, I do want to give a quick shout out. Uh, it looks like we have a, a special guest, Kathleen Egan um, and, and David Egan, who has been a tremendous champion, both of whom have been tremendous champions for um, inclusive employment. And um, David is a former employee of NDSS and um, has been a, a, just an incredible advocate um, in, in this work as well. So thank you so much, Kathleen and David, for joining us. Um, and with that, we are at time. I want to be respectful. I know we're in the middle of the day here. Some of you may be taking a lunch break. Uh, and for those of you watching this back uh, in the future, we greatly appreciate your time and attention on this incredible topic of employment for individuals with disabilities. Jed, thank you so much for joining us. It is such a pleasure to have you and see you. I hope all is well. And uh, we look forward to having you all join us in our next webinar. Thank you all so much. Have a great Thanks day. Thanks for having me. And thank you for everything you guys do for the community. Absolutely. Take care.